Acts chapter 13, verses 26 through 45. Brothers and sisters, children of Abraham's race, and those among you who fear God, it is to us that the word of this salvation has been sent. Since the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize him or the sayings of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled their words by condemning him. Though they found no grounds for the death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him killed. And when they had carried out all that had been written about him, they took him down from the tree and put him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and he appeared for many days to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we ourselves proclaim to you the good news of this promise that was made to our ancestors. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have become your father. As to his raising from the dead, never to return to decay, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure promises of David. Therefore, he also says in another passage, you will not let your holy one see decay. For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and decayed. But the one God raised up did not decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. Man, that's good. So beware that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away, because I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe, even if someone were to explain it to you. As they were leaving, the people urged them to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. The following Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul was saying, insulting him. Let's pray. Father, you are good, and you are holy, you are righteous, and we are grateful this morning that Jesus is the one that was spoken of and written of. God, help us not to be like those who heard and disputed. God, grant us today repentance, forgiveness, and courage to respond to your word. Father, I pray you bless this man today, David, as he opens your book. May your power flow through him from the throne of heaven and help us that we may receive it and that, God, we would respond to it by your power. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Yes, amen. Thank you, Matt. You may be seated. The title this morning is Decisions for Jesus or Disciples of Jesus, and our text will kind of bear that out in just a moment. Back in 2010, the Barnet Research Group, they did um, a big survey on a lot of our students here, the ages 13 to 17, that had made decisions for Jesus. And here's what they saw. They saw just a general population, over 60% of students said that they had made a decision for Jesus. And mainline Protestants, that's going to be mainly your, your, your denominational kids that are going to church. Over 80% of them said that they had made a decision for Jesus. And then non-denominational, still going to church, over 90% of them said that they made a decision for Jesus. So they went and then they looked at ages 18 to 35, if they had a biblical worldview, these same ones right here came back and looked and they saw, they discovered that from the time that they were teenagers to young adults, 6% of them no longer had a biblical worldview, didn't even know if they really still believed in Jesus. 80% went down to less than 20%, and then 90% went down to less than 20% also. 
that had made decisions as teenagers. So there's something happening here between making decisions for Jesus at, in teenage years, childhood, until young adults. And it's something today is called deconstruction of the faith. There's a lot of stuff. If you go online, if you look at this, there's a lot of podcasts. There's a lot of stuff on social media where people are interacting and talking with one another where they are talking about deconstructing their faith. So what they, what they believe when they made a decision for Jesus when they were young, they're now deconstructing that and getting to the point to where many of them, they don't even really believe in Jesus anymore or, and they don't believe in God either. So what's happening between this, these decisions for Jesus and then this destruction, um, de- deconstruction all the way down to where there's so few people as young adults? See, here's what I want you to understand. As long as I've been doing this, I have dealt with a lot of adults that have come to me in their young adult years that have made decisions. They walked the aisle. They said a prayer. They got baptized. They joined the church, whatever it may be. And then as young adults, they come and they say, you know, I don't really know that I knew what I was doing then, whatever it may be. And now I don't really know if I even believe in Jesus. So I have dealt with this firsthand. And so we got to talk about that this morning. You know, I mean, what is our primary focus? Let's think about this for a moment. Is it is our primary focus to get people to make decisions for Jesus, which is good, by the way. Don't think I'm saying we shouldn't do that. That is good. We should. We want people to make decisions for Jesus. Or is our primary focus making disciples of Jesus? So let's talk about this for just a moment. So I was listening to, to some deconstructionists. They were talking about this, and they said one of the things that they said in one of their podcasts was, they're like, Well, you know, they read this text. Let me just read the text, and I'll tell you what they said, and I want to show you why it's important for us to understand the gospel. This is John. This is Mark chapter 1, very beginning. This is Jesus coming on the scene very early in his ministry. This is John the Baptist right here. And after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So what they said is they're like, wait a second, Jesus hasn't even died yet. How is he telling people to believe in the gospel when he hasn't even died yet? Okay, so I wish that I was on the podcast with them because I would explain to them that the gospel is not only the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We say this all the time. Okay, so what, what's happening here is, is that in our culture, what we've done is we've narrowed down the gospel to the plan of salvation only. The plan of salvation is a part of the overall gospel. But it is not only the gospel. So I grew up in a culture where, in the culture that I grew up in, the church culture I grew up in, it was all about getting people to walk the aisle, say the prayer, and get baptized. And once they were baptized, they were members of the church. And then as members of the church, it's your responsibility to get engaged in the discipleship program, Sunday school, whatever it may be that we have. That's kind of your responsibility. Here's the thing. Primarily, most of the discipleship ministries that we have, they would be doing the same thing you're doing right now, sitting and listening and not engaging. Not studying for themselves, not filling in, not doing any writing in a book or anything like that, just sitting and listening and soaking in. And so what happens is that we get a lot of people in church that come, sit, soak, sour, and stink. <laughs> That's what happens. So we talk about getting engaged in this, and, and we're, we're looking about, you know, yes, we want people to make decisions for Jesus. Yes, yes, and yes. And But our primary focus in this is for people to become disciples, all of us, to grow in this discipleship. So let's just look at this for just a moment. All the, I mean, the biblical timeline right here that goes all the way from Adam and Eve and the fall of sin all the way to the judgment and revelation. And here's, by the way, you are part of this story. You are here, right here. I like how they did that. You are here. So we are there but in, the, in the church age between the, the ending of the Bible right here, the apostolic age, and the return of Jesus Christ. We're, so we're part of the biblical story. Here's, here's what I want you to understand. In the very beginning, whenever God created Adam and Eve in the garden, here's what he said. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over it. You are the king. I mean, you you are to like, this is your kingdom and you are to subdue it and have dominion over all the animals. 
So he set them up and he said, Adam and Eve, he said, now you are to have kingdom authority over all of the world, all of the creation. So whenever Adam and Eve, whenever they ate the forbidden fruit, they forfeited their kingdom authority. And so then from, from there on, it goes all the way to the very end. It said, we'll, we'll, we'll come back and look at what's in between in just a moment. But in the very end, Revelation chapter 5. So we go from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And in Revelation, look at what is said here. Speaking of the people who come under the blood of Jesus Christ, this is what it says in Revelation chapter 5. You made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign on the new heaven, the new earth. A kingdom of priests. So that has all been fulfilled. So see, what, what, what I'm saying right here is, is that the gospel, the story of Jesus, is all the way from Adam and Eve. He is the seed spoken of in, in Genesis chapter 3, going all the way from there, all the way to Revelation on his second, re- second coming here. The whole story of Jesus. See, because what happened here at the very beginning is that, that God set up kings and priests and prophets, the law, and all of this, and nothing ever got to the point to where the kingdom was restored. It was not restored until the New Testament, the birth of Christ, the virgin birth of Christ. Here he is, going on Calvary, dying for all the sins of the world. Listen, what he did, what he accomplished in that death, all the sheep and everything, all the sacrifices could never accomplish. His death on the cross paid the sin penalty For everybody of all time, complete, 100%. But that isn't it. We don't stop there. There's not only the death, but there's the burial and the resurrection and the ascension. We are studying right here in Pentecost right now, the New Testament church, beginning of the church. And here's what you have to understand is that the whole, the gospel covers all of this. Why did the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, call their letters The gospel. Gospel, we talk about this all the time. The Greek word, euangelion, what it means is it means to proclaim a message. A euangelion would come to the kingdom and he would proclaim the message to the people of the kingdom. So whenever, at the very beginning, whenever it said that Jesus was proclaiming the euangelion, the gospel, hey, listen, the king has arrived in the kingdom. He's reestablishing kingdom authority for all those who come under his authority. Now we get to be priests here. Listen, we get to rule and reign here right now to a certain extent. And then in the very end, when he comes back, new heaven, new earth, going to be really ruling and reigning at that point. So here's my point this morning. The plan of salvation, a very important part of the gospel. I don't want to get a print and say this morning that that's not important, okay? It's a very important aspect of the gospel, but it is part of the gospel. You could find it even, you could, I mean, it could be argued that you see the plan of salvation in just the, the, the epistles right here. Listen, maybe, maybe many of you have seen this, the Roman road of salvation taken out of Romans, just the book of Romans only. We are sinners by nature and by choice. We receive eternal life as a free gift. God demonstrated his love for us, his enemies. We must trust and surrender to Jesus as Lord. Our assurance of salvation is through Jesus. I mean, that is the plan of salvation. But please, don't let's let's be careful about calling that the gospel. Because whenever we narrow it down to the gospel, then we get someone to go through the plan of salvation, say the prayer, and then they think that's it. And we think that's it. That's our primary focus. And then they're like, they get kind of lost in the shuffle of church. And then, you know, they get to the point to where in their early adulthood, they're starting to listen to deconstruction podcasts and whatever. And they're thinking, well, maybe I don't really believe this. Maybe the church had this wrong. And listen, why did they say, those deconstructionists say, how could he be preaching the gospel when he hadn't died yet? Here's why. Because they did not understand the gospel. Listen, when I get up here on Sunday morning, And I start teaching you theology, and you start yawning and thinking, what does that matter to my life today? I don't care about theology. Well, here's what you have to understand. I will stand before God one day, and I will give an account for every word I've spoken to you up here right now. And your teenagers, when they they roll through here, and they listen to theology, I mean, listen, they will not be able to go into their their, their young adulthood and be like, oh, well, you know, we never really studied the Bible in church. And the Bible, the preacher never really talked about theology. It was all about self-helps and being a better Christian. They won't be able to say that if we go to this. 
Not that our church is better than all the other churches, or I'm better than all the other preachers. Don't misunderstand me. I just want you to understand this is why I do what I'm doing. Our, listen, our children, when, when, when our children, and they, 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 they profess their faith in Christ, they go through kids' faith. Is that it? They call it kids' faith? Before we'll ever baptize them, help them understand what it really means to be a Christian and what it means to be baptized. And by the way, we've got some adults that are in the wings right now waiting to be baptized also. So if you're thinking about getting baptized or you may need baptism, you need to start talking to someone. To me, one of the elders, one of our church leaders, let's talk about baptism. If you're feeling an urge towards that way, let's talk about that. So here we got, um, Matt read this while ago. Let's go back. And we, we studied this last week. So I'm just going to kind of fly through these first few verses till we get to our primary text. And then we'll slow down and look at this. So just as a reminder, last week, this is the Apostle Paul preaching his first sermon in Pisidian Antioch. Okay? So let's look at what, how, what's the structure? How is Paul preaching the gospel? How is Paul presenting the plan of salvation? How are all of the preachers in Acts presenting the gospel? That's what we have to understand. So here we are. What he does, he starts off all the way back with the patriarchs. He starts with Abraham, and he goes to David, and then he skips from David to Jesus, which David is the Messiah, the fulfillment of the promise given to God. Let's look at this. Brothers and sisters, children of Abraham's race, there it is, the patriarch, and those among you who fear God, those are the Gentile believers that are in that synagogue there in Antioch on that day, it is to us that the world, the word of salvation right here, soteria. So remember that word. The Greek word is soteria. Remember that. That'll, that'll mean something to us in a minute. The word of soteria has been sent since the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus or the sayings of the prophets that are read every, remember last week, every single Sabbath, they have fulfilled their words, the Old Testament prophecies, by condemning him, which Jesus fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies. And whenever Paul, whenever Peter, whenever Stephen, when they preached the gospel, they went all the way back in the Old Testament. And what they did is they said, listen, these promises, they are gospelizing us. They're the good, the good news of Jesus, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the Messiah, all fulfilled in Jesus right now. All those promises, he fulfills every single one of them. All the promises are amen and yes in Christ Jesus. Amen. Though they found no grounds for the death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him killed. So here we go. Look at this. See if you see the gospel in this. The word's highlighted. Well, look at what, look at what Paul is preaching. When they had carried out all that had been written about him, those are the prophecies, Old Testament prophecies about his death, they took him down from the tree and they put him in the tomb. Look, he doesn't just talk about just the crucifixion. He talks also about the burial. And look at this. And But God raised him from the dead. So we've always got the resurrection in the gospel story, in the, the presentation here. Listen, church, how many times, I've been guilty of this as a preacher, and how many times have we sat and listened to people talk about the gospel and they stop at the cross? It's just right there. It ends right there. I mean, like, the cross the wonderful cross, yes, but the fulfillment of the king taking over the kingdom is the resurrection from the dead. They never leave that out. We leave that out, but they don't leave. These gospel preachers here, they don't leave it out. Look at this. Mark chapter 8, 27, 31. You want to see Jesus preach the gospel? Jesus preached the gospel. Look at this. Here's what he said. Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? That's the most important thing about the gospel I mean, you go talk to somebody, and they say, you know, I think I want to get saved. Here's the place to start. So what do you think about Jesus? Because there's the gospel. That's the gospel story all the way through the Old Testament through the New Testament. It's the story of Jesus. So what, listen, here it is. Who do people out there, who do they say I am? They answer, well, John, some John the Baptist, other Elijah, still others. I mean, maybe one of the prophets. But you, see, now Jesus says, now what about you? He asks him, who do you say that I am? Peter, you know, we talk about this all the time. Peter's either got the worst answer or the best answer. There's nowhere in between with this boy, you know. This is one of the best ones right here. Peter answered, you are the Messiah. That's the fulfillment. You are, you are God in the flesh. You are the one that will never die. You're the, the anointed one of God. That's what that Messiah meant to them. 
And he strictly warned them not to tell, to tell no one about him at this point, which changes later. And look at this. So Jesus is like, yeah, you got that right. But there's one more thing. And you understand, yes, I am the Messiah, but let's go one more thing now. Look at this. Here's what he says. Then he began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things. And they struggled with that as the Messiah. When they looked at all those Old Testament prophecies of the, the suffering servant, they struggled over understanding that. They understood the, the kingdom prophecies of him being the king and overthrowing, the, you know, setting up the kingdom of God on earth. They liked that. But the suffering servant, that didn't make any sense. How he, the man must be suffering many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. And look at this. And be killed. And look at that. He doesn't leave it there. And rise after three days. So the gospel is a story of Jesus. Okay? Back to Paul preaching. And he, did, look, and he appeared for many days. We saw it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Paul said that, over, that he appeared after his um, death, burial, and resurrection to over 500 people at one time before his ascension. And some of them are still alive. You can go interview them today and check it out. That's what he said. So he appeared for many days to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we ourselves proclaim to you the good news, you and Gileon, of the promise that was made to our ancestors. God has fulfilled this for us. All those, all those promises are fulfilled for us. They're children by what? By just the death and the burial? Well, what, well how's it fulfilled? By raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, capital S, speaking of deity, today I have become your father. Now, in the ancient world, this little bitty sentence right here, when a king, when his prince, his son, was becoming the king, and when he would step back off the throne and he would give his throne to his son, he would say, you are my son, and today I have become your father. That was speaking of the son becoming the king. Do you understand now? What the prophet, the priest, the Old Testament law, the sacrificial system could never institute, Jesus did by his resurrection, death, burial, resurrection. He established the kingdom here on earth. As to his raising him from the dead, never to return to decay, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure promises of David. That's King David, which God promised the Messiah would come through your lineage. So this is quoting Psalm 1610. Therefore, he also says in another passage, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now, now for them, once again, the struggle over this in the Old Testament because they didn't quite understand how, if you're going to say the, the suffering servant, how can he die and then never see decay? Didn't make any sense to them. Makes perfect sense to us when we know the death, burial, and the resurrection. For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, so let me ask you a question this morning. What is your purpose in this generation? How do you know what your purpose is, and how can you be assured that you are living your purpose in this generation? If you don't know, if you don't know any of the answers to any of those, i got good news for you this morning. I'm about to show you how you can know what God's purpose for you in this generation is and how you can live that. Y'all ready for that? How many of y'all done an experience in God before? About five of us? Okay. I've done it about five times. Great truth Henry Blackley put together. We talk about this all the time. See what God is doing. What work is God doing? And then join him in that. Now, this is the, the seven realities of experiencing God right here. So first of all, I can never see, I never know what God's work is. I'm never able to get to the point to where I'm experiencing him if I don't have a relationship with him. How do you know you're saved? And there's all kinds of answers to that question. Now listen, I'll tell you something. You've probably heard your whole life in church. Well, if you're saved, you have a relationship with Jesus. And they were all right when they said that. 100%. You've got to have a relationship with Jesus if you're saved. Listen, if someone came to me and they said, I, they said, I'm married. I went to a justice of the peace 
We got married. We, we got the marriage certificate. I walked out this door. My wife worked out, walked out that door, and I never saw her, never spoke to her again, never lived in the same house. But I got this certificate to show you that I am married. I would be like, mm, you're not really married, man. You didn't say the vows before God, number one. The next thing is, is that you never were in a relationship with this woman. I don't believe you're married. Just because the state of Texas says you're married doesn't mean God says you're married. Now, do you realize that, right? There's a difference between the two. Okay? So I was saying, I could argue that. But, but listen, today, if somebody came to me and they said, are you married? I wouldn't take you to a marriage certificate that says, Melissa and I are married. I wouldn't show you the ring and say, yeah. I would say, oh, we, we said these vows 14 years ago. I wouldn't do all that. I would say, I've got a relationship with Melissa. I've got a growing, intimate relationship with her. And then somebody comes to me and they, they look, they, they see us, they see us together, they see our life, and they go, David, I don't believe you're married. I'd be like, well, you're stupid. That's ridiculous. Somebody like, how do I know if I'm saved? It isn't because I said a prayer or I got baptized, I walked an aisle, I joined the church, or I did any external things. But I have got a living, vibrant, real relationship with Jesus. The Holy Spirit is transforming my life today. That's how I know I'm saved. So in this relationship right here, we know God. So now I can recognize, I can see and hear what he's doing. The invitation is going to come. If I know him, the invitation is going to come to join him in his work. And then God's going to speak. And every time God speaks, it always aligns with this right here. So I know this word. I know I have a relationship with him. And then also, here's the hard part. There's always going to be a crisis of belief. He uses Moses right here. He comes, he speaks to Moses. He says, you got to go back to to Egypt, the place where you're a fugitive from, the place they wanted to kill you, the place that they hate you. That's a crisis of belief. That's the last place he wanted to go. There's always going to be something that you can't do in and of yourself. And then you have to adjust. And when you adjust and you go to that place, you're going to obey, then you get to experience God. So this is how you know your purpose in this generation. It isn't about what you want to do. It isn't about what you think you need to do. It isn't what you look around and think, this is what needs to be done. It's about what God is doing and joining him in that. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses, you've got to go back and read chapter 11 before you understand that. That's all these witnesses that serve God. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. You got any sin that easily ensnares you? If you're saying no right now, then you're lying once again. <laughs> we all, all of us have got these places where we're easily tripped up. And then he says, let us treco. Let us the run right here. It isn't like going out for a leisurely jog. The word, Greek word treco right here means to attack, to go in quickly, to go in with, with enthusiasm. Let us Go in and attack and run with enthusiasm and endurance the race, the, the agon right here. Does that sound like an English, agon? Agony. agony. Boy, a whole bunch of y'all got that one. Because whenever they would go into the, like what we would consider to be the Olympics today, and they go into their whatever it may be, their event, it would be their agon. They would be in this, and usually the agon, they were, this was whenever, I'm not just like competing with myself or against the time, it's I'm competing against a foe, against an enemy. Is this making any more sense to you today because you are up against an enemy? So this agonon, that, and then it's got this interesting Greek word right here, that all these words right here put this one word, translate right here, and the word right here is prekoamia. And what prekoamia means, and it means this specific event or thing that you have marked out for you. Now listen, don't, don't detach what we just said about joining God and what he's doing because here's what I'm telling you. That thing marked out for you, it's joining him in what he's doing. That thing is good. Verse 2 is good too. Look at this. Keeping our eyes on Jesus because we can't join God in what he's doing if we don't have our eyes on Jesus. We're not in relationship with him. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that, and there's that same word again, marked out for him. The joy that was marked out for him. He, hupomeno, 
Hoopo means hopper. Meno means stand. He hopper stood. It means the ability to stand beyond your own natural ability and strength. He, he hoopo meno the cross, despising the shame. And then here's where it gets good. Y'all ready for this? Hey, listen, wake up. Come back in right now because you can't miss this one, okay? This right here is the good one right here. Cathizo. Cathizo is whenever. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. All right. It's whenever the king would get off the throne and the prince was sitting on a throne. It isn't just somebody sitting down a chair like you sat in that chair a while ago. This is the king taking the place of rulership and authority. When he cathizo right here at the right hand of the throne of God. Mm, that's good right there. I should close the sermon right there, but I won't. We'll keep on going. Back to, back to Paul's sermon, which is the best sermon. For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep. That doesn't, that doesn't mean he was sleeping. That means he, everybody in the Bible that's a saint of God it would use fall asleep instead of died. When he fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and he decayed. So don't get David mixed up with the Messiah. Don't get David mixed up with Jesus. But the one God raised up, that's Jesus, he did not decay. Hallelujah. Hey, listen, you know what? Buddha decayed. You know that? Confucius, everybody, everybody else other than Jesus, when they died, they decayed. Jesus is the only one that did not decay. Hallelujah. This is just as good as Easter in here this morning. Amen? We need to read Paul's sermon every Sunday. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you because in the Old Testament, all they were doing was covering their sins. So listen, the people sitting in that synagogue that day get excited right now. Oh, wait, you're, you're, because now they're starting to put together the piece together, the puzzle, and say, you're saying now through the Messiah, my sins can be forgiven, not covered, but forgiven? So listen, Paul's about to drop the hammer now. He's got them all set up, and he's fixing to drop the hammer, and everything's about to change. He's about to use one word that changes everything that's never been used in a sermon before. Y'all ready for this? Everyone who believes is justified. Through him, for it is by grace you are saved through faith. And these are a gift of God. Everyone who believes in Jesus is justified through him. Not through good works. Through him. Not through anything you can do. Not through you being a good person. Through him. For everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses, everything in the Old Testament never justified you. But now, through Jesus, you're... Oh, wait a second. I can see right now that y'all are not as excited about this as I am. So let's talk about what, what justified means, okay? Y'all ready? Look at this. Justified. So let's look about, there's that sot- soteria right We were talking about a while ago, soteria, soteriology right now. So what that ology in Greek is, is to study, soteria, that's so salvation, soteria, soteriology is how you pronounce that. So if you were in seminary or something, you were studying the, the doctrine of salvation, you'd be studying soteriology. Let's look at th- a few things about soteriology this morning. The first one is this. So it begins with regeneration. That's where God imparts new spiritual life to us. It always begins with the Holy Spirit stirring in our hearts. That's the beginning. First point, conversion. We respond to God to the gospel call in repentance of sin and faith in Christ for salvation. So there you can say, that's that decision. And then you can also argue from the other side that you can't make that decision unless you've got the Holy Spirit moving in you because you say, for it is by grace you're saved through faith. God's the one that gives us the ability to work and do his will. And then there's a justification. So what does this mean? God responds to our faith by declaring us completely forgiven, imputing Christ's righteousness to us. So what that imputing means right there is it means that what God does is that if you take our sin account, where if our sin account was all the way, we had hundreds and millions of sins, whatever it may be over here, it's not just that those sins are forgiven and wiped away. But if you go over on the positive side, that Christ's righteousness is put into our account. 
So now the, we are now have the righteousness of Christ in us. That's, that, is, that is what justification means. It means that God sees you totally right and justified in his sight, not because of what you've done, but because of what Christ has done for you, because you're in him. Amen. Now some people are getting as excited as I am. Praise the Lord. And then sanctification that, that, listen, this is where we cooperate with God. We have positional sanctification and progressive. So we progress, we grow in our faith. This is where we become disciples of Jesus right here. For we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who both works and wills for us to do his good purposes. So we work in this, not to be saved, but as a result of our salvation. James says, hey man, you say you've got faith without works? And listen, I want to see your faith by your works. So if you really say it, there's going to be something happening right there, okay? There's also glorification in that, but we won't get into that this morning. So back to Paul's sermon. So beware. Why on earth would he do this? Listen, Paul, don't you know that if you say beware that many people won't come back the next week? <laughs> if you try, start trying to scare people? Oh, but look at this. So beware that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. Oh, Lord, help us. Because here's what happens. Over and over in the Old Testament, the people are trying to follow God, but then they depart, they rebel. And what happens is, is God has to discipline them. Usually he has to send another, another foreign country in it to take them over and destroy them. And then they cry out and they repent. And then there's a revival and they get back and they do good for a little while and they do that same thing over and over again. So with that in mind, what Paul does is he he. he quotes the prophet Habakkuk. Did y'all have your quiet time in Habakkuk this morning? We don't read that one very much. But what happens is, is that, man, everything's falling apart, and Habakkuk, he's crying out to God. He says, God, why aren't you doing something? And then the Babylonians come in, they start destroying the, the, the Jewish people and taking them off hostage, and Habakkuk's like, oh my God, what is, what help? And here's what God says. Look, you scoffers, marvel. How many of y'all like the Marvel comics? You know, marvel, people, that, that Greek word right there for marvel, what that means is to see what a God is doing and just be awestruck by it. Marvel and then <laughs> vanish away. <laughs> see, what he's saying is, is that you're scoffing because you don't understand what God's doing. And listen, you may be all in awestruck by it, but you better be doing some repenting because if not, you will vanish away if you do not repent. Because I am doing a work in your days. You mean the Babylonians coming in and destroying our nation and taking our people off hostage is what you're doing? Yes. Because this is what will get them to cry out and to repent and turn back to God. A work that you will never believe. I can't believe God would use those nasty Gentiles to come in here and do that to us. People, when Paul was preaching, would never believe that Jesus of Nazareth would be the Messiah, a poor carpenter. Do you remember what one of the main arguments was? He's, he's, not from, you know, he's not from Bethlehem. Can you just ask one question? Ask one question. Where were you born? Solves that problem right there, doesn't it? They could not believe that this poor carpenter, because they're looking for a man to be in the lineage of David, a man that's going to be, have political power, a man that's going to be wealthy, all this kind of stuff. He's going to come in and be the Messiah. So it blew them. They could not understand how Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. And he says, listen, you will never believe, even if someone were to explain it to you. You know what that story makes me think of? That makes me think of that story of whenever Jesus tells a story of the rich man in Lazarus. Do you remember how that, that story ends up? It ends up with, with the rich man in hell crying out and saying, you know, let me out and go tell my brothers. And what is the response? Uh, your brothers won't believe even if someone were to come back from the dead. They won't believe. Has someone come back from the dead? Is there people today that still don't believe who scoff? who get up there and they laugh and they, make their, they have their podcast where they make fun of all this and everything. All this, hey, listen, it's not that I'm mad at them or I'm angry with them or I'm in angst with them. I feel sorry for them because they don't understand the truth of the gospel. So here they are. Man, they just heard Paul preach the gospel. And as they were leaving, 
the people urged them to speak about these matters of following Sabbath. So you mean nobody walked an aisle and no one said a prayer? No one spoke in tongues? No one got baptized? I mean, no, no, I mean, he just presented the gospel and they go walking out? He didn't, he didn't push for the decision? Now you see, listen, the decision right here is all about the inward working of the Holy Spirit. If the inward working of the Holy Spirit, then they're going to, this, this is what happens. Look at this. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts you followed Paul and Barnabas. That's what it's going to do. Who were speaking with them. And here's what Paul and Barnabas are saying to them. Urging them to continue in the grace of God. <laughs> For you are saved by what? So I'm thinking these people got saved. I'm thinking these people made the decision. You see what I'm saying? And it's all a working of the Holy Spirit. And, and Paul said, he ain't like, oh, you're fine now, just go. He said, he's going to continue teaching them to grow, to become disciples of Jesus, and to grow in the grace of God. Are you growing in the grace of God? I mean, that's really the question right there. Am I growing in my understanding of the grace of God? So you, you got someone in your life that you are praying for them to be saved? I mean, that's the most important thing. Because here's the thing. If you intellectually talk someone into making a decision, if the work of the Holy Spirit isn't there, then someone can intellectually talk them out of that decision. But whenever the Holy Spirit does the constructing, no man can deconstruct that. I mean, the most important thing we can do is pray the Holy Spirit will be wooing them and drawing them and working on them to where they can't stay away. To where, like, they're going to be bothering you to get you, to get them in church with you. They'll be bothering you and saying, I mean, listen, you know, there was no heavy call for people to be baptized, and we have adults coming saying, I want to be baptized. Was anybody manipulating them, trying to talk them into this? It's a work of the Holy Spirit. We'll cover the rest of these next week. We'll come back. So going all the way back to the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, some of you recognize you know what this is. So whenever God is about to deliver the nation of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, he tells them to kill the lamb, to take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost as so. So that whenever the death angel comes, it will pass over. So we get the Passover feast. Whenever Jesus was what we call having the Lord's Supper, or whatever it may be, the Last Supper, that was the Passover feast, right? So in the Passover feast, it was actually a new covenant. We have grape juice here today, but they had wine, and we do have a little bit of unleavened bread in here. And, you know, I just, this may not matter to you. The re reason we do this is because of this craziness we're in in this world right now about being sanitary and stuff like that and not trying to pass germs on. Because y'all remember, we used to do this. We had the big cups and the big things. I mean, because I mean, we're like, well, this is a big deal. So when we do this, I don't really like it, but it's where we're at right now, okay? So we'll deal with it. Because this right here, the death angel passed over. When they entered, everybody that had entered into this house, they were saved. Okay? Are we on that? Over 100 times in the New Testament, it says that when, speaking of soterian language, salvation language, it says, uses the term, in Christ. So if you are saved today, the biblical terminology for that is you are in Christ. The blood of Christ, this is called an atonement right here, a covering. It covered everybody in that house. 
It's interesting to me because it was a precursor to the cross and the blood of the Lamb that covers our sins. And when we're in Christ, we are saved from sin, death, and the grave. So this morning, as we are ready to take communion, we're coming into communion with God Almighty. Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And man, that messed some people up and the whole bunch of people left after that sermon. Didn't want any part of that. But today we understand that whenever we take the Lord's Supper, that we are communing with God. Now, there's not anything in this that will save us or keep us saved. But here's what I want to also say. What we do is many times we rebel against certain things and we go all the way to the other and we say, this is merely a symbol. And we'll do that back to him. This is merely a symbol. Okay, so I'm going to fall somewhere between the two. Okay? That'd be like me saying, somebody saying, well, I'm, I said a prayer. I said, that's merely a prayer. There may be something very wonderful and special about that prayer that was said. You, you, may, be, you may be led of, of God to go serve someone and I'll be like, that's just an act of good deed. If you're joining God in what he's doing, there's something spiritual about that. So what I would say is that let's don't just say this is just a symbol, okay? Because there's something mysterious between the two that we don't really understand. So I don't just want to downplay this and go, oh, it's just a symbol, eat the cracker, drink the juice, pff, let's go home. Here's what it says. In the New Testament, Paul warned the people before they about this, and he said, Listen, there's some people that are eating and drinking unworthily, and some have died as a result. So examine yourself. So as we always have an invitation, the invitation is to respond to whatever God is doing in your heart. So this morning, I would encourage you right now, in this, during this time of invitation, to examine yourself, to make sure that everything is good between you and God, that everything is right, all sins, man, you've confessed, ask God to forgive you. There's not any stuff there before you take this. And if you feel like, man, listen, there's some stuff right now that just I am out of whack. I don't really want to take it. Well, then don't come get one. It's fine. Nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to be looking around, taking roles, see who does and who doesn't. So you do what you want to do, what you feel is right between you and God. Now, we believe that the people who are in Christ are the ones who take this. That this is for Christians, for believers. So we would encourage you, if you are in Christ, yes, it's open for you. Here's what I'd also ask. We're about to have a time of prayer. So during this time, if you want to come down, if you want to pray, you're welcome to go ahead. And they are, these are, um, and Michael, would you move that microphone around to the other side of that table so we don't knock it over, please, sir? Thank you. So just come and grab one on your, either your way up to come and pray or on your way back after you get through praying. And then once you get one, you can have a seat, okay? So let's go ahead and let's all stand. So let's hit that, that last slide on the computer, please. I got one more slide. There we go. We don't want to end at the cross this morning after all that preaching about how important the resurrection is. So let's do some praying. If you want to come down and pray, you want to come down and grab some of the elements before you pray, then you can do that. Let's come down to the altar this morning and let's do some praying. You know, and if, say, I just don't really know if I'm saved. It's like, I know I'm not saved and I really want to know more about this. Then you're welcome to talk to me after services are over with. You can send me an email, go to our webpage and send me an email and say you'd love to, to uh, meet with me. I'd be happy to meet with you and talk with you about salvation anytime you want to. 
We've got a whole bunch of elders and leaders that can talk to you about salvation also. It isn't just me. But I'll be happy to do that. If you have any theological questions, please email me. I probably get somewhere between five and ten questions through email a month. Be happy to talk to you about any of those theological questions you may have. Don't just sit on it. God, we thank you today for your word, O oh Lord. God, we thank you for the gospel. God, help us to grow in our understanding of gospel theology. God, we thank you for salvation today. God, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins. So right now, maybe the Holy Spirit's bringing something to the forefront of your mind. Let's encourage you to ask God to forgive you. Grant you repentance from your sin. So for those of you who haven't got the elements, if y'all want to, you can send one person from your family to come up and get them if you haven't. Once you get them, if you wouldn't mind, please have a seat.